So welcome to Healing Together, uh, the discussion. My name is Philip, and this is part of Village Wellness Month, um, Healing Together in collaboration with the Village of Yellow Springs and the Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce. So before we jump into introducing each other, I want to jump into the why. Why are we here? Why um, Village Wellness Month? What does it all mean? And Erica Thomas, she is the co-moderator today, and she's going to let us know. Erica, why are we even here? The why of what we're here is um, back in November, we the village did a mammogram event. And I think during that event, we found out there's a lot of people that kind of put health on hold. And it just kind of made me think of what are other items like for health that we can get out to the public that maybe we've been putting off for whatever reason, like in the past couple of years. And um, my original idea was to have like a health truck rally, but that didn't happen. So just with COVID, we wanted to kind of play it safe because we weren't sure where it was going to go. And if it'd be safe to even have like a group of people in an auditorium. So um, that's why we're here to kind of help with like our health and our wellness and Community. I love it. And because of community, uh, she mentioned that we were going to have um, a health truck rally. And instead of that, now we're here with all of you, professionals and experienced professionals when it comes to health and wellness. So I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and let us know how you're connected with health and wellness. And then we're going to just jump into the discussion. So. Hi, (laughs) I'm Jen and I am a yoga teacher. I actually am a yoga teacher. I've been a yoga teacher for 10 years. About five years ago, I got into um, emotional wellness and emotional release therapy. Um, I'm also a a certified in healing with my hands, um, similar to massage therapy, um, but work mostly with people who have emotions that are stored throughout the body in, um, you know, tissues and organs and muscles and helping to um, facilitate that release. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I'm Tim Callahan. I'm a clinical psychologist and I work here in Yellow Springs. I uh, work for Lay and Associates and uh, uh, we are a private group practice and uh, I work with children, teens, adults, um, primarily individual psychotherapy. So I am seeing the the front edge of a lot of the anxiety and depression that uh, are ex- being experienced by everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, a very encouraging time because people are seeking therapy mm-hmm. um, and people who wouldn't typically have come to therapy mm-hmm. and uh, we're seeing a real impact on helping them feel better and uh, getting on with their lives and getting over what has been a very strange and abnormal experience of being uh, under the weight of the pandemic. And uh, we do have supply demand issues. There's a lot of people in need and um, not enough therapies out there, but it's going to change. I think it's temporary. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that two things, I think uh, uh, I do mostly three days a week. I do face to face because when I see children, it's very hard to do that over Zoom. Mm-hmm. But I have two days where I do remote therapy and it's been improved access for people, save them from having to drive here. Um, insurance, Obamacare has done wonders for making it available to people. So. We are thriving, and um, it is a very encouraging time. So, I, again, I, uh, I get to see what's happening and be able to play a part and help people feel better. That's awesome. So we have practical application with yoga. We have um, s- psychology. Um, that's wonderful. Aiden. Hi. Well, my name is Aiden. Uh, I'm a community member here. I'm an artist and a writer. Um, but before that, I was a paramedic and a first responder for nearly 25 years. Um, and I did that up until... Um, nearly exactly a year ago. So I know that this whole panel was sparked um, because of the pandemic and, and those sorts of things. And um, I was there writing that first responder wave um, during our initial stages of that and about the first year of it. And it was through my experience of being a first responder that I, of course, began to encounter mental health, mental health patients, mental health problems, but also began to suffer them myself. Mm-hmm. And through that journey of trying to find my own wellness, I became very interested in, in helping my fellow first responders deal with their problems too. Um, and that is uh, an epidemic all, all on its own mm-hmm. there. Um, but that is where my interest and experience with this comes from. 
it's interesting because through all of your your spheres of expertise, it's going to come in handy because we had a community survey that we put out to the public and ask some questions surrounding health and wellness. What do people do to remain healthy? What are some areas that they'd like to see improved? And Erica has some of those, she, she has some of those um, numbers for us. Erica, I know that you have, um, one of the things that's interesting is you have the stats for the mental health issues. Yes, so before creating the panel, we wanted to find out what is it that our community really needs. So that's why we put out the survey. Um, we put it out on our website and also on our Facebook page uh, just to try to get people to let us know like what it is that we could help with, um, just to identify some concerns. Um, we did ask um, as like specifically for mental health issues that people have dealt with in the past five years. They may not be dealing with them now, but you know, in the past time. So overwhelmingly, anxiety and depression um, has been you know issues that they've dealt with. Um, also like alcohol and addiction worries. Mm. Um, and I think also with the pandemic, just like the stress that also would lead to anxiety and then just maybe negative coping skills that we use for that. So those were, um, you know, of course, isolation. And one, I think even more like out of our control is how other people deal with it. So like, there's one thing about how we deal with things, but as how other people choose to deal with it, because you, you can't control that at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think that uh, was like a recurring theme as far as, um, you know, just some concerns that people have dealt with. So when it comes to, I guess for, for, for you all, when it comes to COVID, that's what we're talking about specifically coming through COVID. Mm -hmm. So Jen, for you, mm -hmm. hearing some of these mental, issue, ment mental health issues that people identify, when it comes to yoga and putting things into practice, you know, do people come to yoga to find that sense of, you know, balance? Does it help with dealing with mental wellness? Well, absolutely. I think that people mostly come for a new experience. I mean, I find that the majority of my people, even though they know, I mean, my, my information is out there. I think some people do come specifically for the emotional release sessions, but when they come for yoga, they leave with a whole new um, grasp on what can actually happen and how the energy in the room and being surrounded by people in love helps you move through what you're dealing with. I mean, movement by itself is healthy for the body. And then moving targeted areas that are um, storing trauma is even better. So you add those things together and then just the energy in the room. I mean, I, it's, the numbers are just, are bar none. People are like, I didn't expect this. Mm. And then it happened and it's like, yeah, I think they come for healing, but I think they leave with a, a totally new perspective of what they were expecting. Mm -hmm. I didn't, when you, being an EM, EMS worker, I'm sure that you came across a lot of people that were in distress. And even Absolutely. now, distress. Let's talk about community. Let's just right. open up the discussion to community, right. right? We're talking about community. One of the things is identifying. I go to yoga sometimes because I want to get fit. Mm -hmm. right. But all of a sudden, you come to see me being EMS because I'm in distress. Yes. Where, and you're going to be able to help with this too, uh, Dr. Tim, where is the, where's the balance? How do I know that I need healing versus knowing that it's a ment That it's a crisis. That it's a crisis. So... It was it was an interesting perspective to get if your if your initial exposure to mental health is as an emergency worker, mm -hmm. you start to have a very uh, skewed vision and an experience of what it means to be mentally ill, and it becomes a very extreme version. You know, mm -hmm. we would see people in extreme forms of mental illness and crisis, um, very delusional, very manic, um, very deeply uh, into drugs or self-injury or, or suicide. Um, and what I found is that living in that world, you tended to think that you were not ill mm. because you were not to that extreme. Mm -hmm. ah. And um, identifying the difference between illness and crisis um, is, is really not that difficult. EMS and police need to be involved when things are out of control, mm -hmm. when there's danger, um, particularly to, to other people, but also to yourselves. And, and it's usually very clear cut. Mm -hmm. and, 
uh, people don't have trouble pulling that trigger. I think where they have trouble is is recognizing when they're ill before it's a crisis. Mm. And I know that that was a big problem for me. You know, I am not as sick as this person that we just brought in that we had to sedate and restrain and fight with the police. Uh, therefore, I don't have any problems at all. Mm. Um, and I think that's an important area of education, something that people need to start recognizing. Um, so you don't have to be in crisis to be sick. I know that there was a question, and Erica, I'm going to come to you in a minute, but I know that there was a question about um, that is along these lines, but Dr. Tim, can I call you that, Dr. Sure. Tim? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're also talking about community and unity. We heard two different perspectives about being in crisis and not in crisis, but in, and knowing that you're in crisis, but there are also witnesses. Sure. How, as, um, as a therapist, how do you help people to understand and have the empathy or the connection to know that people are not okay all the time yeah. mm -hmm. and to interact? We're in a small community, you know, and what you do impacts me. How can I start to see them as, you know, you're in need, you might be in need. What, sure. do, what do we do? Sure. Well, and again, I think it's this grassroots effort to get the word out. So, I mean, not only providing the service to folks, which gives them an environment where they're respected and, and appreciated for what they're going through and normalized because it's a really normal reactions to abnormal situations that give us trouble, including, um, you know, being frontline workers. Um, I do. This is part of the new movement of people coming to therapy. I, I see police officers. I see fire emergency workers, teachers, very few people often appreciate what teachers are under as that frontline <laughs> emergency work. But getting the word out, um, uh, I participate uh, for the past 16 years with what's called crisis intervention training for police, where we help police officers understand how to better interact, understand um, what a mental health crisis is, what it's like to interact with a, a, a child, for example, a teenager with autistic spectrum issues mm -hmm. who might respond completely differently. Yeah getting to parents, getting to the, the community, um, working with, uh, again, um, first responder groups, which one of the things that the pandemic has done as well as the nature of our times is motivated people mm. to get information. Mm. So spreading the word, which then spreads the word for, further so that we are, again, appreciating um, what it means to be healthy and not feeling isolated. Because a lot of people think there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And then they realize, oh, this is my natural reaction. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is the natural reaction to what we're experiencing. And Eric had mentioned the word control. One of the things that's toxic for the brain and actually helps the brain become kind of rewired towards more primitive fight-flight responses is when we have no perceived sense of control. Mm -hmm. hmm. And the pandemic and the world events and a lot of things in people's lives, they don't have a perceived sense of control. So the community is where the solution lies, where we come together to, to feel connected, rely on each other, and have a sense of control over that. Mm -hmm. um, and the anxiety begins to uh, dissipate. Get into, our, um, get into our survey. You mentioned something there when it came to like the social aspect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're bombarded with social media. We're bombarded with a lot of voices. Um, and it may not be the best when it comes to trying balancing anxiety. Okay. Um, because there's a lot of things that are coming in. On our survey, Erica, I know there were some, you know, that were talking about things that seem to be outside the scope of wellness. But when you read them, mm -hmm. yeah. it sounds very much like, you know what, there's something deeper inside. You are very angry and have a lot of anxiety about something that you're not actually identifying as anxiety. Um, Erica, what... What do you see over there? <laughs> what do you see in our survey? And and let me and let me preface preface it this way: um, it's very enlightening to see how things are phrased, and to see how things are put together. And I love the fact that the community was involved in sharing um, in this survey. What do you see over there, Erica? One of the questions that um, I felt had like a good heart behind it because I. Because you do see that um, either the way that people lash out in anger, that they're going through tough times, and we don't always handle that at our best. And that, I think that goes for everybody. It's not just bad people. I think everybody, like the greatest people, can always handle things not their best. Um, so one of the questions was, how can we help our community members show their best selves? 
um, I think that goes into, um, you know, being there for community, giving people, giving grace to your neighbors when you know they're going through something, um, and helping, um, to facilitate more local community activities. Mm -hmm. I think these were all things that were kind of like the underlying, like how the community, um, I did, I really like the fact that the idea of community was in a lot of people's thoughts already, mm -hmm. you know, even before knowing what this was, you know, coming to, I, it's nice to know that people are community minded mm -hmm. with that. Can I just add to that anger is a fear response. Mm -hmm. So people who are afraid, there's a reaction that a lot of times is fear, it's anger. Um, and so having the community together, doing things that's love-based, the fear can't exist. And so anger will dissipate. Yeah. And with that, the really dangerous feature of the pandemic is the isolationism that's led to an unnatural sharing of, of nonverbal connection mm. and relationships. And we've now left with our ideas, which get really mis misunderstood, misconstrued online and, and, the, and Facebook and people start darting things back and forth. And these are just symptomatic of yeah. the isolation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have to return to, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can return back that we have more opportunities. A lot of my friends are musicians that we have more opportunities for them to play music here, work together. There's, you know, I love the idea of the shared kiln and pottery. I'm a woodworker, we should have more opportunity to work together and share over activities that we agree with and we want to learn from. You know, the Zen and the art of doing something together is very important. Yeah. Um, quilt making, things that we could as a village come together, creating spaces um, that are good for the community. The surveys, you know, I think reaching out to teenagers and, and even children and asking, what would you like to see? You know. Uh, building more of the skate park instead of reducing it, building more opportunities for them um, to play a part. And I think for adults, let's listen into the community. People might have great ideas mm -hmm. that it would not be overly expensive to have shared um, opportunity spaces, uh, equipment to do cool things together. Yeah. With the concept of um, April being healing together as well as its panel, I didn't, let me ask you, um, do you think that um, healing is, and this is a, I don't know if this is a difficult one, but do people have to choose to heal? Do you have to identify what the problem is to be able to move forward, to participate in these, um, in the things that you were just suggesting, to see the possibilities? Do you have to choose to do that? Or is that something that, let's say, the village can just have events and then all of a sudden we're healed? What do we have to do? I think if you mean we as individuals, mm -hmm. I think that it is very important to not only to, to choose to heal, but to choose to take the time to notice what it is about you that requires healing. Mm. And I really like this, this comment that you made earlier, how do you help your community members be their best selves? Mm -hmm. There's something implicit in that, in, in, in there's an otherness to that. And, and it seemed to me that this person felt like they knew how to be their best selves. How do I help other people know me? Mm -hmm. And that is how you do it. You take the time to learn what your best self is. Mm -hmm. And in that, you will discover where you need to heal, where you need to improve. And you'll start to find your path towards that. Mm -hmm. And what a community can do is provide those opportunities show people these possible paths so that when they see the one that's right for them, they can take it and begin that healing. But you can't make somebody be like you. Mm -hmm. All you can do to help them be them best, their best selves is to show them what being your best self looks like and, and hope that that example shines through. And when they're ready to go, they will. And I think even on that note, being willing to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and showing people that just because you're a first responder that you're not susceptible to the same things. Right. And that was a huge problem I had when I would, um, when I was first going through that, just first to recognize that I had to become very sick before mm -hmm. I, I couldn't deny any longer yeah. that I was sick. Um, but that, that was a, like a 15 year road 
to that level of crisis where I should have been getting help that whole time. Sure. And mm-hmm. once I was there and I began to see the illness in my, in my coworkers and especially the younger people, and I didn't want them to have to go through what I was going through, mm-hmm. I decided the only way to do that was to start opening up, mm-hmm. telling them what was going on with me, telling them how I was getting help. Mm-hmm. And once you started doing that, you started getting that feedback yeah. right away from yeah. everybody and, and it, um, it, it started from there to get And going to right do that. back into the community and mm-hmm. the safe place and people starting to, realizing that their lack of control isn't really lack of control at all. Mm-hmm. It's this, this is how we grow is together. Mm-hmm. We're created to be in relationships with other people. And, and prevention, it's so much easier than waiting till the symptoms get really uh, a challenge. Early identification, you know, helping people have the resources, talking about it. We've come a long way. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And really, I think that what I'm seeing is so many people who would not normally seek out help are seeking help. And, you know, and I agree, sometimes suffering and pain really drive people um, to realize I have no other alternative. And obviously, would the hope would be that we could prevent that from having to get to that point and really getting the information out. Yeah. And I do think all the destigmatizing efforts we've done over the past 30 years are, are coming to fruition. And the new generations of kids that are coming up mm-hmm. yeah. really don't carry anywhere near the self-judgment and weight of stigma that previous generations have. So yeah. I, I think, think that destigmatization is the most critical part yeah. mm-hmm. in, in terms of getting people to, to access help for their mental health Absolutely. early on. Um, until they can't deny it anymore, because um, there is this feeling that there's something wrong with you if you have mental health. And it it was a feeling that was passed on to to people maybe our age that there was something Mm -hmm. morally wrong with you. Being being crazy was a definite character flaw. Mm -hmm. Um, And instead, I I think that people should look at it in the way you would look at any other illness. And to know that there is a spectrum and that you don't have to be fully ill to be ill, right? You can have a chest cold. It's different from having late stage lung cancer, Mm -hmm. but you're still ill Mm -hmm. and you still might need help. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a great point. And there's nothing to be ashamed of, especially, you know, you worry, oh, I'm not crazy enough. I don't have a problem enough. Well, you do. Well, and what's great about now versus even 10 years ago is that we are really leaning more toward Eastern medicine mm-hmm. and people are looking for new ways instead of just medication to help help themselves gotcha. and it's available it's available I mean we are prime examples of it being available and I love that I love that you said that because it goes right into um, uh, talking about barriers to care and we were um, when you were talking about other forms of um, wellness and other forms, a lot of people, and even in our survey, a lot of people were talking about so many opportunities that they cannot pursue Mm -hmm. because of whatever barriers are there. Either they don't know they're there, they can't afford them. What are some of the barriers that we heard from our community when it comes to care? Well, I think uh, cost was overwhelmingly one of the barriers that was mentioned. And that's even with people that do have health insurance that, um, you know, it's, it can be expensive, um, you know, and also finding somebody if you're, if you are looking for something that's outside of like, I'm going to the doctor, I'm getting antibiotics, I'm getting an x-ray. Um, if it's something more like uh, either their insurance doesn't cover like chiropractic treatment mm-hmm. or um, even uh, like therapy. So just knowing like things that maybe fall outside of like what their insurance covers and being able to then afford it. Um, you know, you mentioned like supply and demand. If you have, if you're having trouble finding a doctor and that's, you know, for either uh, mental or physical health, um, you know, I think that, you know, that is one of the barriers in um, making appointments. So I know with, uh, I had a friend, she has a brand new baby and she has a child and during COVID, it was, just, it was really hard for her to make it to appointments mm-hmm. because she wasn't allowed to bring her children. She had to like go alone. And she doesn't have somebody to, you know, stay with her child at home. And so she would just, like, not go to the appointments. Mm. And that's where I think the communication and building a sense of community. Um, I, you know, I know people that don't have family that live close um, Mm -hmm. or have somebody they can, you know, hey, can you watch my kids just for a couple hours today? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we not everyone has that. So I think building communication with your community and finding out, like, seeking out those groups that, like the support, maybe you don't need the support all the time, but you need it just like every now and then. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, 
um, that would definitely help. Um, and the number of single moms out there. Yeah, I'm one of them. Yeah. Right. I just, you know, it's, so I think just like that communication, when you realize that you're not the only one, that was one of the things um, that I actually, I when I heard that from my therapist, <laughs> when, you know, I was telling her like what I was going through and, you know, she was like, well, Erica, like, you're not the only one that has gone through that. And you're I was like, special. I'm not that <laughs> special. <laughs> so she's like, that should actually make you feel good because to, yeah. to know that you're not alone. Yeah. Like, I'm not like some, you know, one off case that like there's no answer for. Yeah. And, you know, that is like that alone was healing. It's like, oh, OK, so like I'm not alone in this world. You know, however alone I felt I was right before she said it it's like okay well i get it i'm not special like in the you know like pity me which sometimes it's what you want you want somebody to like you know yeah. like but care yeah i deal with that too and, well, i think it's a genuine it's a genuine concern mm -hmm. it's a genuine feeling i am a, i'm a huge proponent of i feel this way mm -hmm. and i'm not going to pretend i don't yeah, i feel so alone even if I'm not, that's how I feel. Right. And I have to train myself not to function in the either honesty or dishonesty of my feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to identify it, walk through it and say, this is not really the case. This is not true. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone, but I feel that way. Now what do I do? Yeah. One of the things that was in there, and I, and I want to ask you this too, um, one of the things that's in there, since we we're talking about community, someone in um, in the community was saying that they were they wanted more um, LGBTQ trans awareness and all of and it, I think Doc um, Doc you were talking about visibility being seen you know community and things like that. How important um, in in your perspective is knowing that you're not alone and being able to identify resources that include you. Do you know what I'm saying? How Absolutely. important is that? It's supremely important. Um, I think that the smaller the minority group is that you belong to, the more isolated you can feel. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been dealing with that a lot lately. I'm just feeling like I am the only one. Mm. I'm the only patient this doctor has ever seen who's trans. I'm the only biracial person that this person's ever met. And you stack these minority categories on to each other and you're, okay, I'm a biracial, trans woman, mental health patient, all these things, and you start to feel very isolated because as that group dwindles, you literally do become more alone as that, that type of person that you identify as. So finding someone else like you or being with uh, a provider who shows some understanding of, of your group mm -hmm. is incredibly important, um, incredibly important. And thank goodness for the internet. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I would not have any friends like me if it weren't for the internet. Um, and if, if people can be visible, and if those resources, because they do exist, um, if that word can be spread and put out there, when people go to find their group or to find someone that will help them, it will be that much easier. Um, and, they, and they will go seek the help. I, I know that a huge barrier to care is just that fear that they're not going to know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm better off trying to do this on my own. Um, so I, I think it is of supreme importance. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Tim, when it comes to healing together, mm -hmm. and we're talking about community, um, I'm going to do this in, in light of community member, how can I help? Because I know a lot of people are going to be looking at this, and either they identify as somebody who needs help, or they're going to identify as somebody who really wants to help. Yeah. In a community that is diverse, in a community with all walks of life here, how can I, and it goes back to the same question I had before, how can I pull those, I guess, scales, I don't want to get all biblical, the scales of my eyes, how can I pull them off my eyes to see that other people are going through something too? Like, how can I be somebody who's in need and be somebody who helps? Sure. 
And, and I think the internet comment's a big one because we we beat it up quite a bit, and we know there are some you know, pros and cons. Yeah, mm -hmm. but definitely. The 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 real grassroots of, I think that is driving the fundamental destigmatization of a whole variety of folks that have been isolated and have suffered all kind of disparities. Um, autistic spectrum have, folks have really driven from the root of it that this is not a disorder. This is a way of being and brought about neurodiversity uh, movement and these groups of people um, in the world of blogs and discussing it. I, I can't believe how many folks I work with where they find so much comfort and support from this world where it can be safely communicated. You can find people. Um, now the question is how we can take it from there where we can actually spend more time together and have forums mm. related to this. But we don't have to, again, invent this. There are people out there. We can invite them to these worlds uh, mm -hmm. here and now. Um, but it is there, and it is happening. And it is slow to evolve at the level of health care providers. Mm -hmm. You're correct that the price is still a real challenge. I'm, I'm fortunate I'm in a field that you know, we can, uh, you know, Medicaid, uh, care source, managed care, Medicaid has allowed for so much uh, support for people to get services. But it's hard for you to bill for that um, in yoga and oh, yeah. acupuncture and massage. These are challenging. We need to get these alternative healing. I'm at the Humanist Center when I'm seeing people face to face and it's filled with wonderful people doing wonderful healing and have for many years mm -hmm. um, and being able to uh, find that affordable. So it's going to take time. We got to keep pushing up against that. We know lobbying is really challenging, yeah. mm -hmm. um, fighting the 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 old system, mm -hmm. and but the momentum is there from the people. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's hard to remain patient because um, it's hard to get these folks to change. And waiting for that generation to move out of the way for the new generation is tough. Yeah. I know that um, it's, I mean, it is changing slowly, but I know even now for alternative, like massage therapy, I do aromatherapy, massage mm -hmm. technique, and um, people's, what do you call it, healthcare savings oh, are paying okay. for that. And, okay. and I mean, it's, it's different than, I mean, I don't take Medicaid and I don't take care, you know, but there are, there are resources and let's just keep working towards that umbrella of getting all of these alternative health methods to be covered. That would yeah. be fantastic. And then, I, well, I'm sorry, Philip, yeah. but I think if you are wondering what you as an individual on a one-on-one -on -one basis can do with interacting with, with your, your fellow community members, I think it's very important to, to realize that, yes, you have a lot in common. You've been through similar stressful events, but you also have a unique experience perspective yeah. and a unique experience as do they. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing that we tend to do nowadays, especially when you are able to filter out people who disagree with you mm -hmm. and find that one group where you start to think that the whole world is represented in this mm -hmm. small group of people who agree with you and then you encounter somebody who maybe thinks or reacts differently than you would, you immediately think, how can I change them? Mm -hmm. How can I fix them? And you, you see that as helping, and it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is, is understand the diversity of their experience, mm -hmm. and it is individually diverse, mm -hmm. and take a step back, settle down, take a breath, and, and try to recognize that they're responding in the best way that they can. Yeah. And, and maybe it is not the best way in the larger picture, but it is, it's their best, and, and if you respond patiently, you can start to smooth these these things out and as a community be able to take a breath so that you can heal together. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think to compound on that too, as your exact question was, how can I be broken and also help? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, but isn't that all of us? Like I'm I'm a teacher and sometimes I make the joke like those who can't do teach. Like, <laughs> right? I've been through so many hard things, divorce and you know, broken body parts and all sorts of things. And yet, as I travel through heal healing and, and discovering um, how to release certain traumas that my body has stored, I can also help those in front of me. We can do it together, just like what you said.
-hmm. that it may not be the same path. It may not be exactly the same traumas. It may not be exactly the same hurts and pains and brokenness, but we can walk through them together. And recognizing that everyone has had something. Absolutely. Everyone has had something and in that is something that you have in common. That's a starting place yeah, is that definitely. everybody needs help or has a story to tell. Yeah. Practicing compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think this is certainly a challenge of our times. Um, this is the solution. And mm -hmm. to really understand that it is a practice and it requires an active effort. Um, and again, to reach out and continue to practice it as, as the uh, ideal way of solving a lot of the, the trouble troubles we have. I know one of the things that people um, one of the things that people said. We're talking a lot about COVID and kind of the like how to heal. Sometimes healing sounds so negative. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, I use the phrase you know broken. It's like oh my gosh, it's so heavy. Mm -hmm. You know, but there are some people. You know, I'm not gonna say myself, but I'll just go ahead and like me <laughs> that you know. COVID wasn't all that bad. I'm mean, like, I mean, I'm an introvert. I'm like, you gave me a reason not to have to go. I am at home. You know, so so how do we, you know, what in in your perspectives, in your in your in your own perspectives, what have been the benefits, if any, the positive spin, the positive PR spin, if you will, on um the past several years dealing with COVID? I I have seen, and we all admit it, this is it's it served such a convenient excuse for the kind of social fasting we all need at times, which is, mm -hmm. I just really don't. I remember when we had our baby, it was like a perfect excuse not to have to go out because we had the baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and COVID served that. And I know a lot of people that um, I think that it is a fundamental change that we will come out of it, but we're not going to return to what we were. Mm. And I do think that it's taught us that it's important that we spend time with people we want to, mm. limit the amount of time we spend with people we don't want to, to the degree that it makes us feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable. I, I do agree we got to reach out, but I do think s social fasting, like a variety of kind of fasting, can be very healing. Social fasting. Uh -huh. I'm yeah. using it. Right. <laughs> word, right? I'm using yeah. it. I know. I'm not, it's not I'm not coming. It's, I'm social fasting. <laughs> well, and how about relationships with moms and kids or dads and kids like didn't those at the beginning anyways i think as time went on it was like oh, okay go back to the cool <laughs> but at the beginning the relationship oh, that i had personally with oh my, my kids it was such a bonding time because everything is go 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 all the time sports and events and all so many things but you don't get the chance to quiet down have okay. dinner together and and i think that so you can look at this last couple years and say there were some really great things that came out of it. Okay. That's one of the things I would say would be like boundaries, I think, were easier to build. Yeah. Or to to say to, no. To, well to stay on like as we came out of it. It's like, oh, well, I don't know. Like I don't know if I want to get together, you know, COVID. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was just kind of easy. It was an easy out, but it was also then to like uh, assess like what your boundaries are. Like I really don't like hanging out with this person mm -hmm. because I don't feel like I don't like how I feel afterwards or um, so I think uh, I mean, I've had friends that like it helped like enforce boundaries that either they never had or they realized they kind of let lax um, because, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't all bad. And I think, you know, it's so like the the good parts we did get. I'm glad that we can take the moment to appreciate, yeah. you know, what we did get. <laughs> I know. Well, just think and that having those physical boundaries imposed on you. I think even if you didn't realize it consciously, subconsciously, you started to think of yourself more individually yes. and consider your space and your life, your needs um, more than you were allowed to do before. Mm -hmm. You were forced into this time, but before okay. that, you weren't allowed mm -hmm. to consider your individual needs. It had to be your children first. It had to be your friends mm -hmm. first or your work. And here you're like, okay, you can't see my face anymore. I've regained some privacy. Mm -hmm. You can't be this close to me. I've regained <laughs> some space. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yes, it was isolating, but it was also very empowering mm -hmm. because now you think that way. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed when, I notice now when people get too close to me. Yeah. And I, I feel like I have less unless, trouble unless taking a step away in. from them. Yeah. You're right. It was before you right. you didn't want mm -hmm. to make them uncomfortable. Now you realize that you do have the space around you that belongs to you. Right. And how about, hi, my name is Jen and I'm a recovering people pleaser. Like <laughs> always wanting to make everyone else happy and say yes and yes. 
And now we have this opportunity to say, but time is too precious. Right. And exactly. no. I think one of the things that's um, super important, and I love this aspect of it, and to the people that are listening that have had, um, you know, some real trauma through COVID, mm -hmm. this doesn't lessen that brunt. Of course. However, the way that we heal together is understanding that everybody's journey mm -hmm. and everybody's experience is not the same, mm -hmm. you know, is unique and it can be both. Mm -hmm. I can think COVID or I can think social media or I can think politics, or I can think whatever the subject is, is completely difficult. Mm -hmm. I also can see the benefit mm -hmm. and understand that somebody may think of it differently than I do. Mm -hmm. And um, and Doc, you were talking about it, and I think our slogan here, a lot of the slogan in Yellow Springs is be kind. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there was a, another word that you used. It wasn't kindness, but it was compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that knowing that it's okay for your experience to not be my own mm -hmm. and having compassion to see your life and your perspective and your experience as equally valuable, mm -hmm. and I don't have to hold you hostage, emotionally hostage mm -hmm. by it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you want to say something? No, I'm just agreeing oh. with you. Oh, okay. What everybody goes through, how everybody perceived the pandemic was different. And I think this is one of the things that Erica and I have talked about um, kind of leading up to this discussion is there's a lot of people out there who don't think they were affected at all. And this was easy for me. This is no big deal. But how about the people who are like, I love the isolation. I want to stay home all the time. And then they don't go to the grocery store anymore and they don't see people's faces and they don't. That's a, that is a trauma response. Mm. And even though you you think it's OK, it you'll just end up sitting and being a cat lady, you know, like I'm, I'm not saying that's a terrible thing. I mean, whatever, but I can say for me personally, I loved staying home. I loved being by myself. And, but then I realized that it wasn't healthy and I wasn't getting the time with other people that I needed and that I actually do. I may be an introvert, extrovert, and I fuel in, in my alone time, but I do need other people. We all do. We need other people. Well, I think that, the kindness and compassion also applied to us, you know, to speak self-compassion and be patient. It's, it's just been, uh, we've never experienced this before. Yeah. Um, it's affected everybody pervasively and across so many, all communities across the world. Yeah. Um, and be patient because it takes some time. Um, and be patient with ourselves, our family, our friends that, you know, create those community experiences and be encouraging, but to not push it. Yeah. Um, I think we tend to be really solvers and we want to come to the solution quickly, mm -hmm. but this is a time to practice a lot of self-compassion and patience. Well, and how is it with like a new puppy or even a new baby? Like you just sit there with your arms open, yeah. be available, and then they'll come to you. you bet. Mm -hmm. And also if, if you are, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are spending your energy and your time trying to fix other people and trying to help them. It's a very convenient way to ignore what's going on with yourself. Oh, of course. And, and I, I think that it's something that a lot of us do in order to not do that hard work and not spend that time within mm -hmm. and discover that maybe we're not as okay as we like to, to tell other people. We're, we're not that perfect sculpture that we've put up for people to view and admire. Mm -hmm. And... I think the message to, to take home from all this is that's perfectly normal and all right mm -hmm. and, and better, mm -hmm. right? It's better to say, this whole experience changed me. Mm -hmm. Maybe it didn't destroy me, but it changed me. Mm -hmm. To not change is, is a problem in and of itself, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right? So if you're sitting there thinking, this pandemic was fine, I'm all good, that, that is a symptom in and of itself. Absolutely. Not that you're not okay. I, but I was like, I feel very attacked. I'm calling you out. Calling you out. We call it Philip syndrome. I know that. Um, I know that we're going to have a lot of resources on um, yso.com, even more than we're we're talking about today. But um, Jen, I have a question for you. Sure. So. Health and wellness, it really can start from within. And there are things that we can do, and this goes back to barriers. Mm -hmm. um, in your expert opinion, what are some things that people can do from where they are 
when it comes to activity? So I think the first and foremost, the biggest thing is to set time aside every single day to be quiet. Whether that means that they need to learn how to meditate, because meditation is different for everyone. Mm -hmm. It is for people who have, you know, squirrely brains, it can be really hard to learn how to meditate. But sitting still and being in your own space, literally, it's this, it's such a huge step. And I bet you probably agree with this. Like just being alone with your with your mind and your thoughts and actually starting to identify with what you're feeling because I think when you go, 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 go all the time or move all the time, you don't get a chance to actually know what's actually happening. So start to process that. And then gentle movement. I mean, so many people, there's a stigma to the word yoga. Mm -hmm. People think you have to bend like a pretzel to be able to do, I can't bend like a pretzel, but it's the moving and the action part. And it, it is, it is rejuvenating. My restorative yoga class is like an hour long nap where we move our bodies just in very gentle, slow ways, but it, it really restores the body's homeostasis. It really restores this place of, um, the way that we're like a rest and digest, like this is mm. where I'm supposed to be. This is my body's autonomic nervous system healing and you don't go, 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 go. So I think first and foremost, sit and be quiet. Secondly, in your own space, in your chairs, in your on your floors, wherever, some movement. And you can find resources everywhere. I have all, all of my classes, I have live streaming available. Mm. So, you know, just some, some sort of gentle movement. It, and it is amazing what movement can do for the mind. I know we haven't talked about it before, but how much, and anybody can answer, how much is um, diet... And Important. not just thinking, but like walking. What I'm trying to do is give people after after they get to the resources and after they may procrastinate themselves away, um, helping others and not helping themselves. What can they do now? How much is that kind of wellness mm -hmm. um, beneficial to my mental stability? Well, and just to follow up with that, that that sitting with it and not trying to solve problems. Mm. We are so quick to solve. We don't sit through it. Mm -hmm. And being mindful, it doesn't need to be something abstract. It really is being here now as much as you can. And one of the things I've learned is we, we often wait for motivation to come mm -hmm. uh, to look at our diet and exercise when it's really less of a prerequisite than a byproduct. Mm -hmm. Start okay. somewhere mm -hmm. and you become more motivated. Mm. And do things like sitting with yourself, stretching. It doesn't need to be elaborate. Um, I think that it is important, of course, to look at diet and exercise. The mm -hmm. spring is here. You see people out. Nature is going to be one of the great healers Absolutely. for us. Absolutely. And but I also know that people have great creativity, but they don't think they do. We have a, a, a terrible way of looking at it in our kind of society, where we think hobbies are somehow less important than meditative practices or work. And mm -hmm. really, do what you love. Do what you want to do, and it often really can bring you to a moment. Mm. And whatever your hobby might be, pour yourself into it. And then next thing you know, you do feel more motivated mm -hmm. to do those other things. So do what you like. Enjoy it. Don't put yourself down by saying, I'm not creative. Because that is just old messages we've yeah. received. Well, and isn't clinically things that happen in your brain when you do something that you love, like dopamine just and serotonin flowing. and yeah. all of that, that just makes you happy. Yeah. And then it's so true. Like, how about when you eat a salad or something, you have a green smoothie, like how much better do you feel about yourself? Yeah. I mean, you may have had a cheeseburger last night, but today I ate a salad. So I feel good. <laughs> I Again, I, I feel you. seen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's something very important in, in all of these things is that whether it's in engaging in a hobby or going to yoga class or changing your diet even one meal at a time, what you're doing is taking action. Mm -hmm. gotcha. When you take action, you, you go from being a passenger to being the pilot. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you regain some of that control that you feel is missing in your life that is causing the anxiety that is feeding into these loops that lead to the inaction. Mm -hmm. So taking some sort of positive action, control and responsibility for your own life mm -hmm. is the key mm -hmm. to, to wellness. Mm -hmm. um, and it will grow from there mm -hmm. if, if these barriers and stigmas are removed from it. How many people have a hobby they want to engage in, but they're embarrassed to mm -hmm. say it? Uh -huh. you know, how many firefighters want to knit, but they don't want to... Mm -hmm do it or whatever it is. And I think that 
removing that stigma for people to truly be themselves and to tell their stories and be their individual selves will enable the action that will enable the the regaining of that sense of control and purpose. A mantra that I say in every single class is we are the gatekeepers of our own body. We have a choice. What you let in, what you let out, what you hold on to, what you don't hold on to. And it's exactly like you t- remove the stigma. You stop saying, this isn't okay to feel this way and feel the way you feel. Uh, you know, isn't it what you just said? Like, I'm going to say, I, I feel like this. You get to decide. You have the option. And then once you, once you realize that you're in the pilot seat and I get to say, I am going to let this anger, hatred, frustration, pain that I'm having, I'm going to release it. And you just took control. You just took the control back. And I love that because um, taking action also, um, independent action sets an example as well. Mm -hmm. The same as negative. Independent positive action, Mm -hmm. the courage that it takes to do something, I guess, outside of your comfort zone and to set a new standard for yourself. It it could be walking. It could be painting. It could be whatever it is. Yoga. Mm -hmm. It could be anything like that. My sphere of influence, number one, I'm going to change. Mm-hmm. In addition, my behavior is going to change. Mm-hmm. My compassion is going to change. My kindness is going to change. And that can start to change the community. That can start us healing together mm-hmm. because it can just take one. And then all of a sudden, there's permission for somebody else to do it too. Yep. You know, I'm the first one standing. You know, mm-hmm. when you go to those conferences, I used this example the other day. When you go to those conferences and they set the food out, and you're always waiting for that one person, one person to grab to the croissant. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I'm it's gonna just, get one now. It, exactly, <laughs> and it can be the same thing with healing. You're yeah. waiting for that one person to say, "Hey, you're doing something different. What is it? Mm-hmm. I love the way that you painted. I've always wanted to play the piano uh, because you did that. I'm gonna do this. Mm-hmm. You know, so the same way social media can spread some things that may be a little bit damaging, it can also in our real social lives. Spread some really healing vibes. Mm-hmm. Inspire. Mm-hmm. Well, there's this, again, stigma there. Men aren't allowed to do the yoga classes. And how many wives have said to me that my husband would love this? He just is afraid to go because there's no men. Like a firefighter knitting. And I'm like, do you see this guy? He comes every week. He's always here. Just come. There is yeah. no judgment in this room. You're here for you and for your own healing. And I say it again. It's every hour. Like, this is your hour. Be with yourself. You know, yeah. like, and, and then, and who cares? Yeah. But we're just so afraid of what everyone else thinks. Well, I think that goes to, Preach. we're not alone. Like, I'm not special in my issues. There's somebody else out there that has my interests yeah. or whatever. So if you find like that one other person, you know, maybe start like a group, start like, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know, firefighters for Afghans. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know what they would knit, yeah. but. Um, so, you know, if you, if you have like a group that you can start and not wait for somebody else to start it, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're able to, yeah, take initiative. Like if it's get together with your neighbors or, you know, your friends, bring all your guy friends to the next yoga class. Right. I think, you know, (laughs) I think that's something that you, we all can't be the only one that does X, Y, Z, you know, like it's there to find your community. And when you stop being ashamed of your differences even if they're small like that if you're like Mm -hmm. oh i'm a guy who wants to do yoga Mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things that's that's not something very large to be ashamed of there's not a lot of stigma attached to that but there's enough for some people Mm -hmm. when you start to do that and you start to remove that from your individual life you will start to empower the whole community to start removing these larger Mm -hmm. stigmas Mm -hmm. maybe this person who who is afraid to go to yoga is really afraid because they're a closeted gay person. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some larger stigma that now your example of being yourself is going to let somebody be themselves and truly heal that pain that they're going through. Um, I was the only out transgender black firefighter that I know of in the world. I never Mm -hmm. found another one. And it was very hard. It didn't end well for me. But because I did that, I know that there are other people that will have less trouble doing mm-hmm. it. And I know that there are other smaller ways that I changed that department just by being there and putting up my hand and telling everyone who I was. Mm-hmm. You know, and it might be as simple as now those guys aren't afraid to knit or go to yoga. It may be as big as somebody else is willing to stand up and say, hey, she wasn't the only trans person here. Mm-hmm. You know, but you have to make those small changes in your own life to empower these larger ones within the community. 
And how great, too, that when you make a small choice, it may, it may not seem small, but you're putting your own blocking on your brain saying, I can't go to yoga or I can't knit. That's, there's so many things wrong with that. But as soon as you do it and you see that it's not scary, that it's not going to hurt me, then other things fall away and you have the freedom to start doing other things on your own, maybe not even in the community and worrying about what other people, but you start having this like yes. freedom and you grow wings and you can start doing things that you never thought possible because you took that step. And, and you're to being that. your best self exactly. and showing other people exactly. that that is possible. Yep. Not that the path is to emulate me and do the exact right. same things but the I effect. did, but that yeah. it is possible to be who you want to be. Absolutely. Well, I hope that I hope that um, people, as they listen, because I'm inspired. I'm like trying to do some introspection, like, well, what am I not doing? <laughs> you know, this is like therapy for me. <laughs> but I hope that what people get from here is that I see myself somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. I can see myself and I can see a journey that I want to be on or that I am on. And now I feel like I have permission yeah. to heal. Now I feel like I have permission to move forward. Somebody told me that it's okay and I'm gonna be brave enough and courageous enough to say, I'll be the first one to get the croissant. <laughs> I'll be the first one to knit. You and know? see who follows. <laughs> and, exactly, and see who follows, see what compassion follows, see what uh, brilliance follows and see what a healing community can do mm -hmm. when so many people take action to do something. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we have more programs. Mm -hmm. We have more places where people can gather. We have more creative outlets yep. because all of a sudden people see what's possible. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Love it. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can clap on the microphone. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Erica, thank you so much for um, for co-hosting here and for taking the time to look through those surveys. I want to thank the community um, for for really reaching out and being so uh, personal with their responses. Mm -hmm. It takes intentionality and it takes honesty mm -hmm. when it comes to healing, specifically in a community, no matter how stereotypically diverse, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and also I want to thank our um, our sponsors today, the event sponsors, the Little Art Theater. I want to thank um, John Fleming at uh, YS Kids Playhouse. And for everybody who is looking for resources, um, some of the resources that we heard today will be on YSO.com during um, Village Health Month Healing Together, we will also have more resources um, on YSO.com. Thank you to the partnership with the Yellow Springs Chamber of Commerce. And, um, and yes, so wherever you are, you now have permission to step out and start your journey and encourage other people to start healing together. So thank you. Thank you.